Chapter 20, The Miracle of Minerva. The council had a man on the inside, so their information was good. They told us what they had learned of Minerva after she had been taken away from us. We had been wrong about the marrow, but not about the theft. Three recruiters drove the Anishinaabe elder female to school number 47E, the school closest to the Espanola settlement. She was compliant, jovial even, and recruiter number one noted in his log that there might be something fatally wrong with the subject's mind. She hummed on the five-hour drive-in and began singing in increasing volume as they processed her, cutting her hair, shaving her skin, scrubbing her body, and preparing her for the, to be hooked up to the conductor. Sensible words, English words, could not be made out, and she refused to answer any questions, not that that was integral to the process. All they needed was to insert the probes, tether the wires, and begin the drain. Recruiter number two left halfway through the preparation. He'd been on the job for over a decade and had never encountered someone so spooky, in his own words, and suffered nervous twitching that spread to his bowels. He rushed to the washroom on the seventh floor and sadly in the removed area of the building without a local fire escape, sealing his fate in a stall filled with his own anxious stench. Really, the recruiters were just there as added sentries at this point. Being at a delicate cerebral stage, it was time for the headmistress to take over and the cardinals to carry out the procedure. Recruiter number three stayed to satisfy his sadistic nature, and recruiter number one slouched off to sleep at his desk behind the storage closet with its caged cages of balls and padding, and he didn't find this part interesting. The chase was the crux. After that, who cared how the savages screamed or cried? The recruiters would later be identified through dental records. Minerva hummed and drummed out an old song on her flannel thighs throughout it all. But when the wires were fastened to her own neural connectors and the probes reached into her heartbeat and instinct, that's when she opened her mouth. That's when she called on the blood memory, her teachings, her ancestors. And that's when she brought the whole thing down. She sang. She sang with volume and pitch and a heartbreaking wail that echoed through her relatives' bones, rattling them in the ground under the school itself, wave after wave changing her heartbeat to a drum, morphing her singular voice to many, pulling every dream from her own marrow and into her song. And there were words, words in the language that the conductors couldn't process, words the cardinals couldn't bear, words the wires couldn't transfer. As it turns out, every dream Minerva had ever dreamed was in the language. It was her gift, her secret, her plan. She collected the dreams like bright beads on a string of nights that wound around her each day, every day, until this one. The wires sparked, the probes malfunctioned, bodies rushed around the room in a flurry of black robes like frantic wings beating against mechanics. The system failed, failed all the way through, the complications of mechanics and computers burning each one down like a pop and a sizzle on a, of a string of Christmas lights, shuddered to ruin one by one. The council's man on the inside was called to school 47E the day after the incident to take stock and investigate. He noted that several Indigenous people were on site, camping around the edges of the property while it still burned, low now, but full and thi of thick smoke, unafraid of the un inhabitants and curious as to the cause of destruction. Gossip spread fast. The school had been imposing, a fallacy of glass and steel against the dustiest expanse of the North Shore clearing, like a middle finger thrown into the sky built in record time. Now it was nothing more than a one-story, maybe two, of jagged edges, melted poles, and broken cement. A spew of office chairs, smashed computer parts, and chewed up bricks lay on the ground around, the f around it, and the fence was mostly thrown down, but the fortified gates still stood. When the council's man exit, exited his black vehicle and walked the remaining path to the gate, strewn with debris from the explosions and subsequent fires and maybe even some looting, the campers moved in closer. Soon the road behind him was dotted with spectators, following him to the useless gates holding nothing from a broken system, torn down by the words of a dreaming old lady. The wind shifted so that the heat and the smell bore down on the road, and with the councilman's watching, the campers made their hands into shallow cups and pulled the air over their heads and faces, making prayers out of the ashes and smoke. Real old-timey.